So in the same way that you look through the window to what lay beyond the window, so as Christians, we use religious art as part of our worship because what we are worshipping lay beyond the art. You must not give your life to idols and this is where some abuses of religious art have come in because there are examples of ignorant Christians treating statues as if those statues somehow, somehow have magic effect that if you place them in your car they bring you luck and will prevent you from crashing. We can't take arguments from people who say, ah oh, but you touch the toe of a statue of Saint Peter from people who kiss a black rock. We can't say, we can't take arguments from people who say, well you venerate your statues from people who venerate a stone cubed building. And Allah has to share his knowledge, share his knowledge with the black rock. Now Allah's attributes cannot be divided against himself. Allah cannot share his attributes with anyone, but he shares his knowledge of um, whom to intercede for with the black rock. That is idolatry. So, we're still here in the, the beautiful um, island of Madeira and um, we're in the, uh, the wonderful city of Fuchal and we've just visited the, sacred, the Museum of Sacred Art and um, I'd like to give a talk about Christian art and religious art because it's often uh, a thing confused, it's often a thing misunderstood it is sometimes a thing abused by Christians um, and it's often misunderstood by those outside of the community. Um, and so we, we, we have to understand firstly how did, how did a group, how did a religious group that was Jewish in nature um, go on to develop the kind of art that we see in things like the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church and then how do we end up getting to a point where you've got Reformation Christians who are refusing to use any kind of imagery at all and where should we stand? So I want to start by just pointing out that one of the most misunderstood passages in the text of scripture is that uh, Exodus 20 verse 4 where it reads, you shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath, or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them, or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me." Now, that, that has been used by Reformed Christians to say that we shouldn't have graven images in churches, and we shouldn't have um, pictures and depictions of things in earth and in heaven and so you find examples of the Puritans in England whitewashing walls and demanding that churches be plain and simple chapels. Um, and uh, there are many Christians today, such as Seventh-day Adventists for example, who, who read that verse and they see in it a condemnation of art mixing with religion. They've got no problem with secular art, no problem with secular sculptures in you know, parks and things like that, but they have a problem with religious art appearing in churches. And I don't think that that is how that verse should be read, and the reason why I don't think that verse should be read in that way is because in Exodus 25 verses 17 and 18 we read this. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold, so a seat, a mercy seat, well a seat is something on earth, of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and one and a half cubits wide, and you shall make two cherubim, cherubim is um, biblical language for angels, so that's something in heaven, you shall make two cherubim of gold, make them of hammered work at the two ends of the mercy seat. 
So the God who in Exodus 20 condemns the uh, making of religious art, if you believe certain interpretations of that passage, in the, in the, at the same time to the same prophet Moses and to the same people, the people of Israel, commands them to make a graven image and to put it on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And as if you read Exodus and Numbers and Leviticus, you realize that the Ark of the Covenant is an essential part, not just of Jewish identity, but Jewish religiosity. It was the central focal point of their religious practice and behaviors, including the sprinkling of blood on the art. So the art was directly connected to their acts of worship towards God. So if we interpret Exodus 20 verse 4 in light uh, 4 and 5 in light of Exodus 25 verses 17 and 18 we realize that what is being forbidden isn't the creation of graven images or religious art but the worship of such things the use of idols of such things and that is actually the proper way to understand Exodus 20, 4 and 5. Because we also see that um, in, the, 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 in the same story of Exodus, God commands Moses to make a serpent, of, a bronze serpent, a fired bronze serpent. He, um, in the, the, the temple, in the instructions on how to build the temple, we see uh, f um, figures, uh, and carvings and hammered works appearing in the temple as part of how the temple is designed and built. And so what we see is that far from demanding some puritanical bland kind of interpretation of um, our religious centers of worship, what is being commanded against is idol worship, the worship of idols. And we see this injunction most clearly in the first epistle of John. Right at the end, the very last verse that Saint John is saying to the congregations is, little children, guard yourself from idols. Now, when he was saying that to his audience, he was speaking to Gentile converts to the church. These Gentile converts had converted from a Roman paganism, a form of Roman paganism, where statues were being worshipped as Zeus, as Aphrodite, as Apollo, um, as well as many other gods that existed in those ancient pantheons. And so what he was speaking against was of those early Christians going back to that, going back to that idol worshipping and the worship of idols, because that was the cultural milieu in which the church was born. Now after the third century, Saint Constantine uh, converts to Christianity and suddenly Christianity becomes an official religion of the state and starts to become accepted as public state and more of the, the acceleration of Christianity, which was already well advanced by this time, but the to half the empire was Christian by the time of St. Constantine, but now it accelerates. And all of a sudden, this society that was, has had centuries of worshiping false gods in temples, suddenly becomes Christian. So what do you do with all these temples? What do you do with all these statues? What do you do with all these customs, these festivals? that have been in existence for centuries that people are accustomed with. What does the church do with all of that in this sudden conversion of the empire? Well, the thing is it makes them Christian. It takes over the temples and turns them into churches. And it uses the idea of religious art to communicate Christian truths. So there's a tradition in the church that the very first icon that was ever made um, was made by Saint Luke and he and Saint Luke made an icon of the um, Saint Mary and the church in the earliest periods in Byzantine culture would portray 
Mary and the saints and other key figures dressed in the modern garb of their time. So Mary was portrayed as a as a Byzantine empress, as a Roman empress. The Christ was portrayed as a Roman king. So we found some children who found a, a very nice playground, so we're gonna move away. So what we have is what we have is that the um, the religious artists of their day are constantly making the, the the presentation of religious figures in the garb of their time, and you see this as a pattern that goes all the way through um, religious art. If you go into any religious art museum, you will have depictions, say, of the Nativity that are made in the 1500s or 1600s, where you see Joseph and Mary and Christ in the stable. And the stable doesn't look anything like a first century Palestine stable, it looks like a stable in the 1500s. And the people dressed in that scene don't look like they're first century Palestinian peasants, they look like peasants of the 1500s. So what they're doing is they're taking this historical scene and they're dressing it in modern garb so that people can understand what is being depicted to them. Because if they were seeing if, if the peasants of the medieval period were seeing a stable of first century Palestine, they wouldn't understand what they were looking at. But they would understand what a stable looks like from the 1500s or the 12th century. And so continuously through religious history, we see that Christians are presenting their religious figures in the garb of the culture that they are in. And that's also true of Christ. Christ is portrayed as a Saharan African in Ethiopia. He's portrayed as a Japanese uh, peasant in, in Japan. He's portrayed as a white man in Europe. Um, and in the, and in, in the Middle East, he's portrayed as an Arab. He's portrayed as a Semite. And so what we see is that art is being used to communicate truth. And as, as this religious art goes forward in the same way that we would venerate things that are connected to people in our in our family history so say in your family you have an heirloom that's come down from your great great granddad his, his binoculars for instance um, you treat that even though it's just a pair of binoculars you treat that with a, a certain kind of respect because it is connected to this figure whom you love and in the same way, religious art is is treated by Christians with a respect, not just because a lot of it is priceless, but it's also a way in which we are reminded of the people that we love through the art. And so we treat the art with a certain degree of respect, a kind of veneration, because of who it reminds us of. Now, there are groups that, that would look at that and say, that's idolatry, that's idolatry, and I'm thinking of Muslims who might say that. And I would say to them that you do exactly the same with your Kaaba. I mean, if the Kaaba is just a house and it's not very important, then could I graffiti on it? No, of course I couldn't. And if I did, would I not be punished? Of course I would. So you have a certain degree of respect for the Kaaba and for the black stone in Mecca that you kiss. I mean, it's not like you go around kissing other black stones, is it? Every time you see a black stone, you don't kiss it. But you kiss the black stone in Mecca, and many Muslims would justify that by saying, well, well, it reminds us of Muhammad. This is what Muhammad did. This is, we, we, it reminds us of Allah, and we love Allah. So you venerate these things because of whom they remind you of, not because of the things in themselves. Though, of course, Muslims believe that the black stone in Mecca is on Judgment Day going to be able to speak and testify about those that love it. So, I mean, it gets a bit confusing. Incidentally, Christians don't have any belief like that. We don't believe that any of our statues are going to come alive and start speaking on Judgment Day. That is idolatry. But so, just as you do with the Kaaba, we Christians treat statues that remind us of people that we love with a degree of veneration. They become a focal point of our religious behavior. 
But whereas you just have it uniquely and succinctly with the carver, well, we have many saints, we're a global church, so we have many pictures of Mary that we would venerate, or many pictures of the Christ, or many pictures or statues of the saints. Now, John Damascus, who was a church father who was writing in the seventh in the in the seven hundreds, spoke about how we should understand the icons, and he was arguing against what was known as iconoclasm, which was a movement, a reaction actually to the success of Islam in the seventh century that tried to destroy religious art. And he was a defender of religious art. And he said that the way to think about religious art is the same way that it, it is a window through to another world. So in the same way that you look through the window to what lay beyond the window, so as Christians, we use religious art as part of our worship because what we are worshiping lay beyond the art just as you look through the window to what lay beyond. You don't stare at the window, you stare through the window. And in the same way, we do not worship the icon, we do not worship the statue, we worship what it represents, we look beyond it to what it is a symbol of, which is God. And in terms of other religious art, there's many examples of religious art that aren't meant to even be included as as, as a, a focal point of our worship. It's there to contemplate, because the art is not capturing a historical scene, it, it's communicating theological truths. So you see pictures with, with montages brought together of different biblical scenes that in the Bible are separate. But they're brought together so that you can reflect upon them. And they're brought, and, and religious art served as an educational device in a time when Christians didn't use, and we'll just move a bit further this way, as we seem to have found a busy time at this point. I promise you, when we started this video, this courtyard was empty. <laughs> now we've started filming, suddenly everyone has decided to come. So, when, um, when you see religious art um, that's bringing together these different scenes, they are also acting as a, a, an aid memoir to an oral tradition because the use of a book a printed book is a very new thing it only came about during the printing press so that Christians would end up having to learn the stories by rote in understanding what happened in the scriptural stories and the the picture would serve as a means you the father would bring his son and he would tell the story of the nativity using the picture as an aid and he would tell his son, and his son would learn the story again and again, year after year, at the appropriate festival again and again, and then he would tell his son using the same pictures. And over time, the church has produced such great art, it has had art donated to it, it has had gifts donated it, and because it has been a continuous institution over 2,000 years, it has collected a mammoth collection, an, an unprecedented collection of religious art and has developed incredible art and developed the technique of art itself and and many of this has, has produced the great masters that we now celebrate that you can go and see inside the Sistine Chapel for instance religious art therefore is something that is not uh, an obligation of the Christian faith it is not something that we were commanded to create it was something that became permissible because as Christ became a man he represented God in a physical form which meant that we can represent Christ in imagery as well that means that as Christians it is something that developed religious art as an outworking of what Christian theology and Christian worship was within a culture that had already had its own forms of religious art. It helped us to communicate those truths to those people that were her fresh converts and had not yet converted and it allowed us to communicate our truth to them in a way that they understood. And what that meant was that their developed tradition of religious art within the church, quite separate from scripture, but guided by scripture. 
So for instance, Orthodox Christians will not use graven statues, they will only use flat icons because they interpret Exodus 24 and 5 as saying nothing graven. Reformist Christians interpret Exodus 4 and 5 as saying no religious art at all. Catholics interpret the verse in, in, in the most reduced sense, in the sense of saying you don't worship it in the way that you worship God. But the thing that all Christians agree upon is that you must not worship idols. You must not give your life to idols. And this is where some abuses of religious art have come in. Because there are examples of ignorant Christians treating statues as if those statues somehow, somehow have magic effect. That if you place them in your car, they bring you luck and will prevent you from crashing. That's utter nonsense. Those statues are just art, nothing more. And so as Christians, we must guard ourselves from any kind of failure in starting to think that these things can have any kind of power or can communicate power because they don't. But they can be a part of our Christian worship and because of whom they remind us of, we treat them with a degree of respect that we call veneration. And that I just wanted to give you as an introduction to Christian art, its origins, its usages, its development, its abuses, and its defense against those that would use it as an attack against us. And I just want to finish really on the defense point, because we as Christians can't take lectures about, oh, you bow down to a statue from people that bow down to a rock. We can't take arguments from people who say, ah, oh, but you touch the toe of a statue of St. Peter from people who kiss a black rock. We can't say, we can't take arguments from people who say, well, you venerate your statues from people who venerate a stone cubed building. No, we can't take any such arguments from you because you have no moral high ground, no moral high ground upon which to speak at all. But here is a fundamental difference between our faith and your faith. You believe, and go and check your hadiths if you don't believe me, that the black stone in Mecca will come alive and will speak and intercede for you. That means that Allah has to give it articulation and it has to speak to Allah and Allah has to share his knowledge, share his knowledge with the black rock. Now Allah's attributes cannot be divided against himself. Allah cannot share his attributes with anyone, but he shares his knowledge of um, whom to intercede for with the black rock. That is idolatry. We Christians don't believe that any statue is going to speak for us. We don't believe that any statue is going to intercede for us. Only the ignorant amongst us have such silly concepts. So when you accuse us of idolatry, you should look to yourselves because our faith and your faith have many things in common in terms of veneration and respect and using it as a focal point of religion. But we don't have the misdemeanors that we find in the hadith traditions and so i invite you muslim who's watching this video to come to a true monotheism and i invite you O christian to know your history your traditions your customs and to celebrate them because we have bejeweled the earth with wonderful art that everyone can appreciate and enjoy and that is one of our contributions to civilization.